Oh, Albert? Yes. We had trouble because you, the email went into our junk and then it disappeared. So that's why we're late. But sorry about that. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. We'll try. We'll try. Very again. <laughs> that again. Mm. Okay, good. Okay. Looks like today we have a bit more people around. Okay, let's get started. Uh, we are still on about civilization. Uh, last week we talked about the Inca civilization. Now we are moving back to Asia. So we are talking about the civilizations that is in today's India. So let's call it the history of India. According to consensus, in modern genetics and not technically uh, modern humans first arrived in the Indian subcontinent between 73 to 55,000 years ago. So however, the earliest non-human remains uh, in the South Asia dates to about 30,000 years ago. So we don't, we are still lacking a bit of uh, evidence to show that uh, it is uh, going uh, for that long, okay? So that is coming from uh, this particular book, the quotation. Okay, let me start with a little movie. The modern nation of India derives its English name from the Indus River in modern day Pakistan. It was around this river valley where the oldest Indian civilization was formed. Through archeological records, we know that they traded with the world's oldest cities in Sumeria. There, they witnessed the world's oldest metropolises where a labyrinth of busy cramped winding streets filled the city in a chaotic fashion. They bore witness to merchants tracking their wares in the oldest of written languages, fantastic marketplaces. They saw the amazing benefits of the wheel in transportation, construction, and warfare. Fantastic temples, skilled metalworkers, and mighty kings. When they returned home from the long trek, one thing we know definitely made an impression on them. The place stank. Sewage ran open onto the streets, and sanitation was severely lacking by their standards. Then something spectacular happened. They became history's first great master plumbers. Using the power of the Indus River, they created covered sewers, indoor wells in every home, private restrooms, and with millions of identical bricks, they created spacious homes on a grid-like pattern with large ventilated granaries in every city. Then the population skyrocketed, and in an area larger than Mesopotamia or ancient Egypt, their civilization flourished. With more than 2,000 cities and towns, the Indus Valley civilization became the most populous on earth. Their merchant fleets created a massive trade network along the Persian Gulf Coast to Mesopotamia, Arabia, and back. They would develop their own intricate and unique written language, which has never been deciphered and bears no similarity to any other known written language. The names of their kings, gods, wars, great triumphs and failures, and even their great city's names have faded away. Around 1500 BC, a series of unfortunate events began that would doom this civilization. First, the climate. Many of the tributaries of the Indus River, which their cities depended on, drastically changed course, flooding some cities and turning others into derelict husks that slowly were covered by the sands of time. And if surviving the weather was not enough, then came the Aryans. They too had suffered from climactic change. Their river valley homes around what is today Turkmenistan had dried up and they were seeking greener pastures for their large herds of cattle and horses. They were among the first to domesticate the horse and use the increased mobility to transplant their people onto the Iranian plateau. And then they crossed the Suleiman and Hindu Kush mountain ranges into the Indus Valley. There, the vestiges of the already decimated in this valley civilization were wiped from all human knowledge or recollection until their remains were excavated in the early 20th century. 
The Aryans founded several kingdoms along the Ganges River. We know their names in mythological histories because their epics and language have survived till today and is the basis for many of today's Indian languages. Throughout the period known as the Vedic Age, these Aryan kingdoms would constantly wage war on each other. During this time, the Hindu faith developed alongside the Mahabharata, the longest poem ever written. Some have compared this work to the impact of the Bible, Quran, and the epics of Homer. A social class or caste system would also develop during the Vedic age. At the top were the Brahmin or priests. Below them were the Kshatriyas, the ruling warrior and kingly class. Then came the Visayas, the skilled workers, merchants, and minor officials. The Sudras were the lowest class and consisted of unskilled workers. People were expected to eat with and marry within their own caste. Breaking the caste system's rules meant that one was a pariah or outcast or untouchable. Society's worst and least desirable jobs were left for this class, such as street cleaning and sewage cleaning. In 518 BC, the Persian Achaemenid Empire's armies would cross the Hindu Kush mountains, as their Aryan cousins had done a thousand years before, and subjugated the myriad of principalities that dotted the western Indus Valley. In the east arose a powerful king, Mahapadmananda, in the region of Magadha. He was a son of a king, but he was considered of low birth because of his mother, who was of the Sudras caste. His rise to power was opposed by his brothers who were of full royal blood. This, however, did not hold him back as he had them eliminated. Mahapadmananda would subjugate kingdom after kingdom, creating a true empire in his own name. He amassed a gigantic army of over 200,000 men, thousands of elephants, and chariots. After Mahapadmananda's death, his son would succeed him to the throne. It was during his reign that Alexander of Macedon conquered the documented Persian Empire, crossed the Hindu Kush, defeated their vassals and hostile kingdoms in the region. These two empires, however, would not last. Alexander would die young, and the Nanda Empire would soon be overthrown by Chandragupta. <laughs> Surviving sources written long after his death vary widely on whether he was born a commoner or of regal descent. Also, whether he overthrew the Nanda Empire easily or through a long war of conquest. According to one account, he met Alexander the Great and started his consolidation in the Punjab region, there taking the Greek satrapies and moving eastward. After his death, his son maintained his empire, but it would be his grandson, Ashoka, who would be the most famous king of the Mauryan dynasty. Ashoka was violent and power hungry as a young man. And according to one source, he killed 99 of his brothers to secure the throne. He would expand his empire east into what is today Myanmar and west to the borders of modern day Iran and into Afghanistan. He would expand into the south and in the eighth year of his reign, he would wage war on the small but powerful state of Kalinga. Their large army would not be enough to defend their kingdom. And in a short war, over 100,000 would die on both sides. And then something strange happened. He felt bad. Ashoka converted to Buddhism and promoted peace, respect, and harmony within society. He erected pillars stating his vision for a different type of society all over his kingdom. He ruled out the rest of his 36 year reign in peace and prosperity. However, only 50 years after his death, his empire would fragment into violent chaos once again. Buddhism, which was prevalent in Ashoka's reign, would gradually fade away in India, but thrived in the Far East. Over the centuries, many kingdoms would rise and fall in the Indian subcontinent. The Gupta Empire was considered a golden age for art, architecture, and scholarly pursuits. but none would come close to Ashoka's until the Mughal Empire. These invaders from the north were descendants of the Mongols. They would propagate Islam in India 
and ruled there for almost 300 years. During the reign of Akbar the Great, he tripled the size and wealth of the Mughal Empire. He was a vicious conqueror, but a just ruler. He would abolish the jizya, the infidel tax on non-Muslims, and elevated non-Muslims to high civil and military positions throughout his kingdom. He built libraries and schools across his realm for both Muslims and Hindus. The Ibadat Khana was a magnificent building that he erected as a meeting house for religious scholars from different religious groups to conduct discussions and peaceful debates on religious beliefs. There could be found Muslims, Hindus, Jains, Christians, and Buddhists discussing the finer points of human existence. After Akbar's death, the Mughal Empire would continue to expand. However, over the generations, the empire gradually became less tolerant and the empire was weakened by tension between the majority Hindu population and the Muslim ruling class. Also, the increased complacency and corruption that the ruling class became accustomed to after so many years of prosperity made them vulnerable. This was a situation that the Dutch, Portuguese, French, and English all sought to exploit. The British East India Company, with their vast private armies, eventually winning out taking control of Southern India first, and then gradually extending their influence over the whole subcontinent through extortion, bribery, and military engagements. The Mughal Empire was finally brought to an end in the Indian Rebellion of 1857. This was an insurrection against the British East India Company that functioned as a sovereign power on behalf of the British crown. Someone had the not so bright idea to issue ammunition that had been wrapped in pig's fat to the company's troops. This offended both Hindus and Muslims alike and led to a series of unfortunate events that ended in the defeated rebellion and over 800,000 dead. After the rebellion, Britain would directly rule India. In World War I, over 1 million Indian troops would fight the German empire overseas. In World War II, the British took volunteers and by 1945 had raised 2.5 million men, the largest all-volunteer force in history. After the war, in 1947, India obtained its independence from Great Britain by an act of parliament. The two regions with the highest density Islamic populations were partitioned off, forming West and East Pakistan. In the months that followed the partition, approximately 15 million people migrated from their ancestral homelands to the nation whose majority shared their same religion. Chaotic mass migration saw ever escalating and retaliatory acts of violence committed against Hindus and Muslims alike, and a series of tragic massacres. Over 1 million people would die during this period of resettlement. Tensions are still high between these two nuclear armed neighbors. India is now the world's largest democracy. Recently, they have elected a religious minority and a member of a lower caste as prime ministers. India is the third largest economy in the world and is rapidly growing and is expected to exceed China in population in the near future. This has been Epimetheus. Like and subscribe if you like the content and hit the bell icon next to the subscribe button if you would like to get updates. Every okay, so that is a rather brief introduction. So we'll uh, go for it again, but this time in a little bit more details because I need to go through that a couple of times in order to understand. So I suppose uh, for those who are not in the origin might have the same problem. So let's do it again. The history of India is filled with incredible stories of thriving civilizations, religions, and cultures. Dating all the way back to the Paleoithic Age, India's civilization is one of the oldest that we know and has played a part on the world stage for centuries and even still today. While it is impossible to truly capture all of India's history in one video, it still serves as a worthy topic to delve into. Evidence of cave paintings and stone tools have revealed that the first signs of human activity in India can be traced back to somewhere between 400,000 and 200,000 BC. Details concerning the civilizations inhabiting the region back that long ago do not exist, but we do know 
that one of the first sophisticated societies to walk the lands of India was the Harappan people, who likely existed throughout the first few thousand years BC. Positioned along the Indus River, the Harappan people had their own writing system, advanced social and economic system, and impressive urban cities and architecture. It is unknown why this civilization collapsed around 1500 BC, but some attribute their demise to the common floods and other natural disasters in the region, or potentially invaders from Western and Central Asia. The next known civilization to leave a mark on Indian history books was the Vedic Aryans. These people were initially migrants who spoke an early form of Sanskrit and were determined to stay true to their own tribal identity. The name they've been given, the Vedic people, comes from four sacred texts, or Vedas, that have presented researchers with a glimpse into the civilization's lives and beliefs. These Vedas are often considered to be the oldest Hindu scripts, and the Vedic civilization is believed to have spread their culture across a large portion of India by roughly 1000 BC. With them, the Vedic Aryans brought their philosophical beliefs. These ideas represent a theory that happiness and salvation come from a person's morals and ethics, and one's path should be based upon their place in life, but should always be righteous and good. The Vedic Aryans also shared their societal system as they extended their reach. This system was made up originally of three tiers, Brahman, or priest, Kshatriya, or warrior, and Vaishya, or commoner. The Aryans continued to spread their tribal settlements across India throughout the following centuries as their own civilization grew and flourished in both culture and trade. A series of 16 individual settlements or states spanned across northern India, including the Gandhara, Kosala, Kuru, and the Magat. The latter particularly flourished under the rule of Chandragupta Maurya during the 4th century BC as it began to expand and its leader grew his own authority and worked to form the Mauryan Empire, which is believed to be the first Indian imperial power. The Mauryan Empire established its capital in Pataliputra, near modern-day Patna, and constructed extraordinary temples, libraries, palaces, and even a university. The empire's trade success was impressive, and it maintained a remarkable governmental system and strong army. By the time of the third emperor, the grandson of Chandragupta, a stance of non-violence was taken after a bloody struggle against the kingdom of Kalinga due to the emperor's new Buddhist beliefs. Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, had been born in 560 BC, and by the reign of Emperor Ashoka, the religious system he had founded was becoming more and more prevalent throughout India. Potentially due to their unwillingness to participate in conflict, though, the Mauryan Empire eventually dissolved in the 2nd century BC after the last line of the Maurya line, Brihadratha, was murdered by his commander-in-chief, who would later found the Shunga dynasty in 185 BC. Despite the fact that Brihadratha's assassin Pushyamitra was rumored to have persecuted Buddhists, it appeared that Buddhism faced no decline concurrent with his rise to power. During Pushyamitra's reign, his kingdom maintained authority over a series of provinces as he stood his ground against other powers attempting to expand their territory towards his own. After the monarch's death, though, his dynasty seemed to have fallen in terms of importance. The dynasty is not known to have done anything notably relevant, and their control was short-lived. A variety of settlements and invading powers controlled India at this time, one being the Kushana Kingdom, known for their significant trade involvement with Chinese, Persian, and Roman empires along the Silk Road. One Kushana ruler, Kanishka, in the first century AD, also converted to Buddhism and helps to further the religion throughout the region. In 75 AD, the Kushana kingdom marked a new era, the Shaka era. A bit of distance from the Kushanas in the south, a handful of other powers rose, fell, and fought for supremacy amongst each other. 
The kingdoms of Satavahana, Chera, Chola, and Panja were some of the major authorities in the south during this time and through the Classical Age. The Gupta Empire became the face of northern India during the Classical Age, and the majority of the region was united under their authority during what is often described as Northern India's Golden Age. The reign of the Gupta Empire is regarded as a time of law and order, as well as cultural flourishing. The rulers of the empire were no strangers to military expedition, but aims to expand their territory through peaceful means, such as martial alliances, no less than through military action. Though the Gupta Empire had extensive success over centuries, they eventually reached a point of decline between the 5th and 6th centuries as invading Huns from Central Asia began to annex and take over the formerly dominant empire's land. As the religions of Buddhism and what later became Hinduism thrived, local and trespassing authorities continued to fight for territory and dominion over the following centuries. The next major shakeup of the Indian civilization came with the arrival of Islam. Muslim invaders began to send missions to India the century after the death of the Prophet Muhammad. A series of Muslim sultans began to lead expeditions into India, claiming places such as Sindh, Multan, and Somnath. These incursions brought the defeat of native kingdoms and the destruction of Hindu temples along the way. The Rajputs stood as one of the most determined defenders against sultan invaders, but they were ultimately defeated in 1192 by Muhammad Ghori and his forces. As Islam began to work its way into India, other previously principal religions, such as Buddhism, began to decline. By the start of the 13th century, the era of the Delhi Sultanate's dominion arose. The first dynasty within the Delhi Sultanate was founded by Qutub ud-Din Aibak. The slave dynasty controlled the Sultanates until around 1290, when the Kilji dynasty took over, first by the hand of Jahal ud-Din Kilji. His family held the throne for less than a century, as the Tughlaq dynasty was next to seize power in 1320. The Tughlaq dynasty technically retained power until 1412, but matters were complicated by the incursion led by Timur in 1398 into Delhi. As the Tughlaq dynasty weakened, the Sayyid dynasty replaced them starting in 1414. The Sayyids lasted for roughly 37 years, but the last ruler's reign was stained by rebellion and discord as the dynasty fell from grace. Yet another dynastic authority took the open throne, this time being the Lodi dynasty. The new dynasty lasted until the death of the then current ruler, Ibrahim Khan Lodi, who was killed in battle at Panipat by the army of Kabul's leader, Babur, in 1526. Ibrahim's death brought about the final end of the Delhi Sultanate as a whole. Now free of competition from the Lodi dynasty, Babur established the Mughal dynasty, which would end up becoming one of the greatest throughout history. The original Turkic-Mongol imperial power ruled a vast majority of India for over two centuries and brought about significant cultural growth and architectural achievements, including the great Taj Mahal. Despite their immense success, the Mughal Empire began its decline around the start of the 18th century, as revolt after revolt began to shake the foundations of the widespread power, alongside threats from the Marathas and the British. The British East India Company had actually already been in the region for some time, but the situation with the British started to escalate not long after the Mughals fell. By 1857, India displayed increasing control by the East India Company, and the locals were having none of it. What began as a simple revolt by Indian soldiers in Mirit quickly blew up into a widespread rebellion and became known as the Indian Mutiny of 1857. This rebellion later would be called the First War of Indian Independence, and even though the British were able to quell the revolt after a matter of months, it inevitably had lasting impacts. In response to the mutiny, on November 1st, 1858, Britain's Queen Victoria declared that India would be ruled in the name of the British Crown from that point on.
Locals maintained their disapproval and anger at the British supremacy over their land, and nationalist sentiments and movements were far from extinguished. The next major move towards independence came when Mahatma Gandhi and the Indian National Congress decided to withdraw all cooperation with the British government, beginning the non-cooperation movement following the end of World War I. When this strategy did not bring the wanted results, Gandhi adopted a new technique in the form of the Civil Disobedience Movement in December of 1929. Essentially, the movement was made up of the declaration of an Indian Independence Day that would be celebrated on January 16th and complete disobedience of any orders by the British government. Again, Gandhi's strategy failed, and this time he was even arrested while many other rebels were murdered. Still, the British were eventually pushed into the Round Table Conferences beginning in November of 1930, the second of which Gandhi attended. The conferences marked another failure, and civil disobedience reignited. Gandhi's next attempt, the Quit India Movement, again made no drastic progress. World War II brought about new issues as India was forced into war by the British. But at the conflict's conclusion, a new Labour Party came into power in India and showed sympathy towards the fight for independence. Finally, as August 14th turned to 15th in 1947, India became an independent nation. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then what happened? Okay. India's modern history consists of war, rebellion, independence, and all that comes along with the establishment of a new nation. From world wars to independence from the British to the Indo-Pakistan wars, a lot has happened for the young sovereign state in the past century. When World War I broke out, India was still under the British crown and was, therefore, an automatic contributor to the Triple Entente's war efforts. Over one million Indian troops joined the fight, making the Indian Army one of the largest armies involved. In the Second World War, India sent over 2.5 million troops to fight under British command. While India itself was not really in a position of authority during these wars due to their contemporary lack of independence, both events were still a notable part of the country's history, given the number of men who joined the fight alongside Britain. This video was sponsored by The Great Courses Plus. Because I like to create videos about history, I seek to know more about this topic every day. But regardless of your passions, learning new things should be an important goal in life. The Great Courses Plus is a subscription on-demand video learning service with top-notch courses from top professors from great universities and other experts. Through your subscription, you get access to over 11,000 video lectures about anything that might interest you, from mm. finance to music. You may find so many great lectures to watch. I recommend a great course called A History of India. An award-winning professor takes you on a breathtaking survey of South Asia from its earliest societies and civilizations to the modern days of India. In this course, you can find more information about the Indian subcontinent, a place with such a rich history. The Great Courses Plus is giving our viewers a great offer of a free trial. You can support our channel and also learn new things by clicking on my link in the description and subscribing to The Great Courses Plus. Though the Allies won World War II, the effects of the conflict were impressively damaging for the British Empire. Agreements with the United States led Britain to begin decolonizing many of its territories and paved the way for India's independence movement to be accelerated. On June 3rd, 1947, the last British Governor General of India, Viscount Louise Montbatten, declared the partitioning of British India into India and Pakistan, and the nations became their own sovereign states by August 15th of the same year. This break from the British crown gave both countries the choice of staying in or leaving the British Commonwealth, but in 1949, India chose to stay. By this point, Jawaharlal Nehru had become independent India's first prime minister after serving as the leader of the Indian National Congress prior to 1947. 
The deputy prime minister was Vallabh Bhai Patel, who played a significant role in teaming up with Mahatma Gandhi and Jawaharlal Nehru during the independence movement. Under his and Prime Minister Nehru's watchful eyes, a dramatic population exchange occurred between the Hindu majority of India and the Muslim majority of Pakistan, in addition to the first Kashmir war between the young neighboring nations. The first of four Indo-Pakistani conflicts, the Kashmir War, was a conflict over the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir and lasted from 1947 through 1948. While the provinces of Bengal and Punjab were to be divided between the newly formed India and Pakistan, the fate of Jammu and Kashmir was still unsettled and Pakistan, anticipating the dissension, decided to mobilize tribal militia groups from Waziristan a few weeks before the war actually broke out. The reason why Jammu and Kashmir's destiny was so uncertain was due to the fact that the princely state was led by a Hindu Maharaja but was made up of a Muslim majority. There was heavy pressure from both sides to accede to either India or Pakistan, but some citizens of the state were even considering a push for complete independence from both countries. Tensions boiled over at the start of October 1947 when a pro-Pakistani tribal rebellion in Kashmir broke out and the Pakistani troops quickly came to their aid. Pakistan's goal was to seize the capital, Srinagar, within the first weeks of their arrival. Eventually, the Maharaja called on India for military assistance, and India agreed under the condition that Kashmir become part of India. The state's prime minister and Maharaja both accepted, and the instrument of accession was signed on October 26, 1947. Still, Pakistan and their tribal allies were unwilling to give up the fight. Combat continued until December of 1948, and there didn't seem to be an easy solution without major reinforcements and aggressive action from the Indian side. Desperate for a resolution, India approached the United Nations for support, and a ceasefire between India and Pakistan was reached with the UN's help on January 1st, 1949. The same year, other princely states, such as Manipur and Tripura, also acceded to India, and the nation's constitution was close to being established. In November of 1949, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar and his committee drafted the official constitution of India, which would come into effect and turn the country into an independent democratic republic on January 26, 1950, and Dr. Rajendra Prasad would become the first president of of the Republic. The first democratic elections were held in India in 1951 through 1952 over a four-month span and brought a turnout of over 60%, re-electing both Prime Minister Hava Harlal Nehru and President Rajendra Prasad for second terms. During Nehru's second term, many reforms and legislative changes were made, and a Soviet-inspired five-year plan was composed for the economy. Rights for women in Hindu societies were increased, caste discrimination was condemned with new legislation, and school education was encouraged. Nehru also appointed the States Reorganization Commission, which led to the passage of the States Reorganization Act in 1956. Many state borders were rearranged to create a better separation of linguistic and ethnic majorities as part of this decision. Many other milestones were reached during this time as well, including the launching of an atomic energy program in 1954, India's first computer being installed in 1955, Foreign policy under Nehru involved the co-founding of the Non-Aligned Movement, maintaining friendly relations with both the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Despite this more neutral stance, though, India decided in 1961 to invade and annex Portugal's colony of Goa after repeated unsuccessful petitions for a peaceful transfer. The following year, the Sino-Indian War between China and India briefly broke out due to a dispute over the Himalayan border, but a ceasefire was unilaterally declared by China only a month after the conflict began. There was a short span of peace, during which Prime Minister Nehru passed away on May 27, 1964, and was succeeded by Lal Bahadur Shastri. 
1965, India was again into war with Pakistan over the state of Kashmir. No notable changes were made by the warfare, and a ceasefire was eventually pushed on both sides by foreign powers who feared escalation. The Tashkent Agreement was signed by India and Pakistan on January 10, 1966, and had been mediated by the Soviet Union. Mysteriously, Prime Minister Shastri died the night after the agreement was signed. Either way, the Prime Minister's untimely death resulted in Indira Gandhi, the daughter of Nehru, taking Shastri's place. In the next year's election, the Indian National Congress Party won fewer seats than they had in the past, likely due to the growing unemployment, economic stagnation, and rising prices brought about by the party's leadership so far. The Prime Minister's political advisor came to the aid of her reputation, however, and advised a shift towards more socialist policies, including the slashing of the Privy Purse Agreement, which gave payments to ruling families of the former princely states as part of their original deal to accede to India back in 1947. Prime Minister Gandhi's other decisions, including major attacks on the Congress Party's hierarchy and the subject of nationalizing the nation's bank, earned her increased popularity amongst the masses. Gandhi won re-election in 1971 and had now obtained an even larger majority, which only grew further as a result of her decision to intervene in the Bangladesh Liberation War, bringing about the Third Indo-Pakistani War. The conflict resulted in the freedom of East Pakistan, now known as Bangladesh. India also increased its involvement in world affairs, signing a 20-year Indo-Soviet Treaty of Peace, Friendship and Cooperation in August of 1971 aligning with the Soviet Union and adding strain to its relationship with the United States. In 1973, a rebellion broke out in the Kingdom of Sakim, led by anti-royalist rioters who wished to abolish the monarchy. After two years of discord, Sakim's prime minister reached out to India's government with an appeal for Sakim to become an Indian state. The offer was taken, and the Indian army made their way to Gantok in order to get some control in the region and disarm the Sakim Palace Guards. A referendum was then held, showing a 97.5% favor for putting an end to the monarchy and integrating into India. On May 16, 1975, that wish became a reality, making Sakim the 22nd state of the Indian Union. While India grew, Prime Minister Gandhi's popularity now took a downward spiral as allegations of corruption from the people. Indira Gandhi's power was at risk as her opposition from all sides came together to protest the Prime Minister's accused dictatorship. She eventually advised President Ali Ahmed to declare a state of emergency in order to give her additional powers and the ability to suspend the civil liberties of their citizens under the guise of maintaining law and order. State and national elections were also postponed, and almost 1,000 members of the opposition were thrown into prisons, protests being banned in indefinitely. While the economy was actually improving by the lack of political unrest and new productivity, the government was continuously accused of corruption and abuses of power, making it no surprise that Indira Gandhi and her Congress party were routed in the 1977 general elections by the Janata Party. Moraji Desai became the new prime minister. Then, Charan Singh became the fifth prime minister in 1979 as the Janata coalition fell into disarray. Singh's interim government was replaced in January of 1980 by Indira Gandhi and her Congress party once again, although after a rise in tensions and violence in the Sikh community of India following Operation Blue Star and the raid of the Golden Temple, which was being used by rebellious Khalistan militants as a hideout, Indira Gandhi was assassinated by her own Sikh bodyguards in 1984. Anti-Sikh riots erupted in Delhi, and thousands of Sikhs perished as a result. Members of Congress were accused of inciting the violence, but the party was fairly unfazed and moved on to choose Rajiv Gandhi, Indiri's eldest son, as her replacement. Under Rajiv's administration, Parliament was dissolved in 1989. The Congress party gained a 415 to 545 majority, and many reforms took place, as well as improved relations with the United States. Prime Minister Rajiv had a mostly flawless reputation, known by the press as Mr. Clean. 
until a scandal was unearthed, revealing that a weapons contract between India and Sweden provided kickbacks from the Swedish arms dealer for multiple politicians on both sides, including Rajiv Gandhi himself. The Congress party's popularity plummeted once again, and Singh became the next prime minister after the 1989 elections. More governmental unrest followed until Nara Simha Rao took power in 1991 and made sweeping economic and political reforms. While the Bombay riots and other Hindu-Muslim conflicts exploded across India, new corruption stripped most support from Rao's administration and party, and they were humiliated at the next election by the Bharatiya Janata Party. Under this party's new leadership, relations with the U.S. greatly improved, and the American president, Bill Clinton, made a visit to India to promote the relationship even further. Attempts were also made to create more friendly ties with Pakistan, but a failed summit in 2001 brought about no real change. Today, India is still a developing nation with almost 1.4 billion people and so many ethnicities. While the history of India is rich and vast, the independent nation is still growing into a truly strong and developed country of its own. Okay. Uh, I think... That's it for my presentation, and we can start some uh, discussion. <laughs> the first point I want to uh, want to point out is that the um, Indian uh, subcontinent has um, not been united for most of its time. During most of its history, it has been small kingdoms. Uh, fighting each other, and then uh, some large kingdom unite again, and then uh, I think today's India probably is, is the largest in its history, but there are still a, a large amount of uh, internal issues around India. For example, the Kasi system is still there, and the language is not uh, unified. They have a different language in different states. The, um, the current development is still uh, ongoing. And of course, we look forward to Indian uh, improving their uh, economy and livelihoods. But uh, I think it's still a long way into a modern uh, society. So the, the, I would say Indian it still have a lot of problems to solve. Okay, I will op open it up. Anybody, any question? <laughs> um, yes, um, Albert, am I right in thinking that that, um, that Eastern, that, that, that Pakistan originally was in two sections? Yeah, I think. Yeah. They have always been, uh, for example, during a lot of times, they have been uh, in one uh, kingdom. Because yeah. the Indus River is actually uh, in Pakistan, and India is named after the Indus River. <laughs> so <laughs> they should be, um, one. yeah. But, but did, did one part of what, what, what once was um, Pakistan become Bangladesh? Yeah, it did. They, right. Initially, they were the uh, Eastern Pakistan, the Western Pakistan. So they are supposed to be. But unfortunately, these two places is not connected. So it is no. very difficult to rule two, two area which is not connected. And in between them, there is an enemy. <laughs> the, right. The, yeah. So I had, yeah, I had no idea that had happened. <laughs> yeah. And, and therefore, you have to split because otherwise, it is just not viable. No. So eventually, uh, the East Pakistan becomes today's uh, Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. Right. Thank but you. Both of them are Islam countries. Yeah. Any more? Any question? No. <laughs> so. Um, Another interesting question is, of course, um, 
will Indian's uh, economy overtake China? Population wise, it will, because um, China is now faced with a serious problem of um, fertility numbers. The fertility rate number at the moment is not sustainable. So China has already uh, removed its one child policy, implement two child policy, and now it becomes free trial policy. So still uh, having problem of increasing its fertility rates. But India definitely in terms of uh, population will overtake uh, China. In terms of land size, India is much smaller than uh, China in terms of land size. But in terms of agricultural production, um, Chinese production is about three times that of uh, India in terms of agricultural product. So there's a hidden problem is, can Indian feed itself? If Indian cannot feed itself, we might see a very large potential problem in the future. So there's one issue here. Uh, the population growth is obviously uh, good for increasing productivity because you have more supply of labor. But again, uh, we need a educated workforce. So the Indian education system is also called into question. Will India able to uh, sustain an increasing population together with increasing uh, food supply as well as um, social supports? Mm -hmm. So in India, I. Of course, India is the largest democracy in the world. <laughs> yes, almost 1.4 billion people and run with a democratic society uh, system, government system. So it is the largest democracy. But India has a lot of problems. It tried to be um, a non alliance with any superpower. So the Indian uh, policy, international policy have been independent. That means it try to main, uh, remain friends with uh, previous uh, Soviet Union and then uh, with Americans. But today we are seeing uh, Indian uh, moving closer to America, getting much more closer in the recent, say, uh, five to 10 years, especially under Modi. Uh, I think, I don't know whether it is good for India or not. Uh, India has such a population, I think uh, a wise move should be uh, independence, independent foreign policy, uh, striking a balance between um, China, uh, America, Russia, and then European Union. If they can strike a balance there, I think they, they will get a very good deal in, if they can play the cards right. But Today, I see India getting too close to, to America. And I don't think that is uh, good for India in the long run. Uh, at the moment, a lot of high-tech industry in the United States, the CEOs in these high-tech industries are Indians. So Indians has been uh, exporting a lot of CEOs. That is a very interesting uh, observation, whereas Chinese haven't export any number of good CEOs in the um, major tech companies. But um, the Chinese um, te technology wise, uh, for example, in a lot of the high tech um, research laboratories, uh, Chinese scientists take a very a senior role. So Indians um, in the Western, uh, international companies, they take a very senior management role. So there, there's a difference between the Chinese and the Indian there. So India is, is obviously one country we will, we will have to uh, watch, watch out in terms of international politics because its sheer size of population is an important country. Any other comments? Um, yes. I'll go on. You go. No, no, you go. Mm. <laughs> I 
I just wondered where um, where their atomic energy um, efforts are going. Pakistan's got bomb a bomb, I think, and um, and 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 they do. India does. Um, but I was wondering about peaceful atomic energy. Are they are they using reactors? And yeah, Indian Indians has been uh, using uh, peaceful use of atomic energy. But in, I think India has a unique uh, position in terms of using hydropower. Uh -huh. mm. but, uh, we, remember, that we, we have seen so far that India seems never crossed that Himalaya. <laughs> <laughs> so what we are talk, looking at is there's all, almost a line there, the Indian never cross, cross, cross over, and that's the, the Himalaya. Okay. Mm. Uh, as the nah, we we know that uh, when there's sunshine, uh, earth, the land heat up first. The sea did, didn't heat up as much, mm -hmm. but also the sea doesn't cool as much. So um, because water has a much larger heat capacity, uh, the sorry, specific heat capacity, so it absorbs energy, but it doesn't rise temperature too much. And then you lost energy, but it doesn't lose temperature too much. Mm -hmm. Now, with sunlight going on, it, so for example, in summer, the Indian land mass is being hit up by sun. Therefore, mm -hmm. the air rises in the Indian continent and cool air from the Indian ocean is drawn by this upward uh, air into India. So that is the monsoon. Uh, Indian monsoon is very clear. Uh, in the summer, the the rain, the winds are blowing in the uh, north north uh, northern direction. In the winter, it's blowing in the eastern direction, uh, the, the, the southern direction. So there is a very clear monsoon rain coming into India. India is one of the wettest uh, place on Earth because as the moist Indian Ocean air flows into the Indian Ocean then it rises, pushes up by the Himalayas, and therefore it will fall down. So India has a lot of water rain, a lot of, a lot of rainfall. And this rainfall obviously captured by the high, high mountains in the uh, southern side of Himalaya. And therefore it has a huge potential for hydroelectric energy. But hydroelectric energy is, uh, depends on your civil engineering. You, the ability to build uh, large dams. So I think eventually Indians should be able to power itself uh, with a combination of um, wind, solar, and hydropower. Hydropower should be able to provide India with a very stable baseline load. But obviously um, nuclear power is, is another, another possible use in India. But I personally, I, I will, Say India at the mo at the current technological levels uh, will be a bit risky in terms of controlling uh, nuclear power. They need a better educated uh, com um, workforce at least uh, for for that industry to pour forage. But that's only my opinion. Uh, yes, Patrika. Um, I, I was going to ask you, Albert, whether there was potential um, um, risk or, or um, barrier to India developing as fully as it might because of the class system, which is still maintained there to the disadvantage of so many. Yeah, I think uh, that is very difficult to, to break through, I, I think. But if India is going to... to develop into a modern nation. It really have to uh, break that caste system because mm. caste system, basically a lot of, a lot of talents. And then uh, another issue is of course their um, education of their women. Mm. Because after all, well, put it that way, uh, humans uh, intelligence is distributed in a normal fashion among the population, there's bound to have uh, some smart people anywhere. So by blocking a, a, a large number of uh, citizens from reaching their 
uh, highest potential. You are lost in talents. Mm. So I think for India, the, the most difficult thing is actually overcome the current um, tribal um, political power. Each different state, each different village have a very large tribal uh, political force. And how to overcome that is a major, major issue. If they can overcome that and then overcome the caste system, then India will be on the path to a modern uh, nation. But at the moment, I don't see potential there, unfortunately. Mm. Thank you. Okay. No, no more problem questions. <laughs> okay. Um, next time I will talk about the Chinese civilization. I, well, I'm a Chinese, so I definitely want to tell you <laughs> my. <story. laughs> and then, and then we will move on to some other issues. Uh, the the way I want to do the rest is instead of uh, looking history in terms of uh, time wise. I want to look at uh, issues from a vertical direction. That means I will select an issue and then talk about the issue throughout the whole time from antiquity to modern. I will do it vertically in, in different ways rather than uh, like most history, they will look at one, one time and then the other time following it. I rather do it in a vertical way because my background is not history. So <laughs> I, I will choose to do it vertically. So that is my plan for for the rest of the year. But um, next time we'll do uh, a general introduction to to Chinese culture. I don't know whether I can do it in one one because for for Chinese culture, I have too many things to tell you. <laughs> 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 so I will try uh, probably in two uh, two, and then um, another interesting I want to do is compare China with. Uh, Ch Ch Chinese culture with other cultures because I think at the moment uh, the world needs to understand China. Mm. So I hope mm. I can I can tell you a bit more about a more Chinese way of thinking, <laughs> philosophy, etc. In order to start telling a Chinese story. So I will try to do that in the next one or two uh, meetings. Okay. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, mm -hmm. I will switch over to China today and then. Some of you may see you there over there. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Albert. Thanks, thank you, Albert. Bye. 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 Bye.